perfect. Uh, is that on? There you go. Yes. Hello, everyone. So Hi. this is Andy from Yokai Express. This is Andy from Yokai Express. Uh, tell them first, what is a yokai? Well, yeah, a lot of people ask why we use a yokai this name. Um, I don't know if you guys know. Um, yokai is kind of ghost or monster in Japan. So it's the ghost can appear anywhere, anytime. So we want people to enjoy all the gourmet food anytime, anywhere. So you don't have any limitation about restaurant operation hour. And right. The most important thing is my kids love yokai watch the animation. <laughs> so, so well, just, <laughs> if there are any trademark lawyers in the room, we can just skip on by. No, but that's important, the idea that these things can pop up anywhere. So now that they know what a yokai is, yes. uh, tell them what it does. And it's downstairs, again, if you want to see it in the mid-level there. Yeah, so uh, basically we want to show people that this is so-called autonomous restaurant. We don't want to show this is only the vending machine because for um, the, um, in the past e experience, people just think about vending machine only provide a low quality food or even a snack or something. But right now we are bringing a restaurant grade quality food into the automated system. So you can actually order it um, in a system, no restriction, you can use all the payment method you want. Even if you have a Bitcoin, you want to buy both ramen, you are welcome to use it. So that's why we, we try to change the regular restaurant, um, the typical way they sell the product to the customer. We just bring in to the um, vending system. So we call that restaurant in a box. So literally what you do, and you can experience this downstairs, I think at least for a little while until you run out of bowls of ramen. But explain the workflow for people. Like when they walk up to the machine, what is the experience like? So it's just like a typical vending machine. You just go there and then choose the, um, the icon and then choose the menu you like. And it's not like a traditional vending machine. We show on the screen that what's the ingredient inside of this uh, menu and then uh, how kind, uh, what kind of a nutrition fact you will get. So you know what exactly you have. And the photo of the, um, the ball uh, actually represent the ball coming out of the machine. So it's not like you dump everything like messy inside the ball and then come out. When you open a lid, take out a seal, you feel like it's well presented. Just like when you get a bowl of ramen from the restaurant. So just so people know, the machine holds how many, so you freeze the meals, right? And then how many does a machine hold right now? So the machine that we demo, Downstairs or upstairs? Downstairs. downstairs. <laughs> like the one we demo downstairs is 40 bowls only, and then we have a f limited four menu option. But the new uh, machine coming out um, end of this month, we increase the capacity to ADA, and then we can up to uh, 20 different menu options. But we will not put 20 because a lot of people, they have a difficulty to make a choice. So <laughs> we maybe just put up to 10. But we can do mix match. So we don't need to worry about, like, you only want to eat the noodle soup, but we also have a rice plate coming out. Right. So I think what's um, wh uh, one of the things to note here is just the idea of, like, the supply chain, right? So uh, you can ship. Right now you're only in the Bay Area, correct? And how many machines do you have up and running? So right now we have a 17 machine in the San Francisco Bay Area, and then we are expanding to nationwide. So we are going to New York. We are going to Chicago, Boston. Uh, Florida, Texas, everywhere. So um, we have uh, our central kitchen to pre-process the food, and then we use a cold chain to ship the product to the designated location, and then we have our own um, restocking staff followed by the cloud server. They will do the AI analysis to make sure that which location have a restock, uh, uh, stock running low, so they can automatically dispatch those person to do the restocking. So we don't really need to have an operator anymore. So system will go everything by themselves. So one that I know of is if you're in San Francisco, if you go to the Metreon uh, down by the movie theater, there's one there for people who are in the Bay Area or travel to the Bay Area. Um, so. You, but what's important is this isn't, so again, you put your money in and out comes a bowl of hot, like literally just piping hot ramen. And it's frozen, right? They're, they're yeah, cooked in frozen. Yeah, it's from frozen, it's from frozen stage. Okay, and then you're reconstituting it and heating it up and serving it. It also spits out uh, chopsticks and utensils. Yeah, we have a utensil set, yeah. Yeah. So it comes with it. 
Uh, and I, I just want to do this, all of this so you can understand, because I, I, I know a lot of you probably aren't from the Bay Area, so you may not have seen it, just to understand just kind of how this is changing what automated vending is like. Yeah, I think, um, I don't know if you know in the Bay Area, the rent is going sky high. The labor cost is going like minimum wage is $15 above. So for the restaurant owner, actually, they don't have those luxury to support a lot of the staff working on site anymore. So that's why we come out with a solution. You have a restaurant in the box. Actually, you can hook out the power. You can start your own operation immediately. So that's why we do the central kitchen, um, do the SOP for all the menus. We control all the logistics. So make sure every location, the taste is exactly the same from the shelf. And the idea here is, I, I think, with the restaurant in a box, because you actually had a Michelin star chef come up with the menu, right? So, yes. like, it's not an afterthought as to what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Like, you're literally going in and going, okay, yes, this is a frozen food and it's stacked 40 deep in a machine, but the original recipe came from a Michelin star chef. Yeah, actually, our CCO, uh, Chef Culinary Officer, he owns uh, three Japanese restaurants in San Francisco, and uh, one of them got Michelin one star in 2017. So we, we're pretty proud of our recipe development because everything is authentic. So that's why we want to show people best of the best, not crappy food, yeah. What, are, so what spaces are you going after when you uh, target a location? So we don't really have a like best spot in a in a location. Actually, we can go all over the place. In the San Francisco, we are in school. We are in the hospital. We are in a amusement park. We are in a business unit. We are in. We are going to in the San Francisco airport, San Jose airport. So actually, everywhere if people need something to eat twenty four seven, that would be our spot. Now, do you, is your operations team running 24 hours a day? So if it gets low at, you know, the San Jose airport at 2 a.m. in the morning because some flight got canceled and everybody on board? So that's, uh, a, that's a beauty of uh, machine learning because once you collect enough sales data, you will know which flavor is more popular. For example, if I sell like black garlic ramen, always sold out every day, then maybe starting from a week after, I'm going to re... re um, we're going to change the overall restart frequency or the quantity of each, each ramen. So we will be optimized the, the start, uh, restocking, and then we will minimize the frequency for the restocking. OK, so as you scale up your team to scale up your operations, what's sort of the mix of people that you're hiring right now or looking as you grow your teams? I mean, is it, is it in logistics? Or is that something you want to offload to a third party? Is it in data analysis? Is it in software for a UI design? Well, actually, our team right now is pretty small. We only have 13 people. We are hiring all kind of uh, talent from software engineer, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, data analysis, operation team. Actually, we are expanding globally, not only nationwide, but globally. So actually, we are hiring a lot of people to support. Okay, so there is no sort of, you're not focusing on one particular area or there isn't a, a need. Okay. Uh, one of the things I also want you to talk about, again, this is just sort of, I'm trying to level set so that for people who haven't had a chance to look at it downstairs yet or haven't experienced it, one of the things that I found interesting about Yokai is that you accept airline vouchers as a form of payment, which I thought was really smart because, you know, where are you going to spend those if all the shops are closed? Yeah, basically the... Um, once we got a contract with the SFO, we immediately go after the airline because we saw a lot of uh, news in a, in a, on the internet. They said that you got kicked out by the airline. They give you a $15 voucher, but you have nowhere to spend. It ex expire after 24 hours. So actually, we are the only, um, I would say, only restaurant that you can accept a voucher anytime, anywhere. Even you go out the airport. As long as you can find our machine, you can read it on site within 24 hours. So I think that's a beauty that we work with those kind of uh, big airlines that they can they can allow us to adopt those kind of solutions. And how did you? Was that difficult in doing? Like how? I, just because I haven't seen that before, right? So as a startup, was that? What was that process like? Getting to the airlines, telling them, hey, we want to be able to accept this as a payment, tying in with all of the necessary systems. Was it or not a big deal at all? It's painful. It's just, 
just keep calling, send out email, try and go to uh, set up a meeting with them. For example, SFO, we have been talking for the past two years, but finally we will get in this month. So don't give up, just continue to try, yeah. <laughs> don't quit. Uh, Excellent. So, you know, in our, in our final couple of minutes here, some of the things, in addition to airline vouchers, you, has, you also accept Bitcoin, as you mentioned earlier. Has anybody paid in Bitcoin? Well, actually, yes. In the a, in a very beginning, when the Bitcoin is like almost 20,000. So right now, you know, the price is 7,000, so we disable it. <laughs> Otherwise, we lost a lot. <laughs> yeah. So, yes. Some, some uh, tech people, they do use uh, uh, Bitcoin or like Litecoin, other cryptocurrencies. Oh, tech people. Um, so what have been some of the challenges, aside from getting airlines on board to accept vouchers, or for you to accept, what have been some challenges for you as you grow and as you look to expand? Yeah, I think right now we're facing a lot of challenges about energy, a power supply, because I... I I think it's not only for us. I think Brigo also have an issue because every our, um, big uh, machine, we need a lot of power. So, for example, when we go to the school, those kind of uh, school, they have an old building. They don't supply high power ampage. So that's why we have some limitation to install the machine in a dormitory or in a classroom. But the good thing is right now we are uh, developing our own battery pack. So in, a going, uh, in the future, we're going to have our own battery pack installed inside the machine. So literally, we just plug into the power anywhere, then we can start operation. So is that like a hybrid then? Is it some of it, it's drawing on some of your battery power and from a direct, from the well, plug-in? Actually, actually, it's just like um, the battery pack connect to the wall plug. And then when we use the power, we draw from the battery. And then when you idle, continue to charge it. Gotcha. All right. Yeah. Yes. So it's like a yes. yes. OK. Yeah. I, I, I get what you're saying. That's interesting. And then uh, last question here. What, aside from power, are you plumbed into the system? Or are you? No, we don't plumb. Yeah. OK. So you have a water tank or something on? Uh, actually, we don't have any like water waste or something. OK. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, but the one thing, what are, as you're going out, it's funny, I can imagine a hospital if you draw too much power and somebody's iron lung just goes <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah, so that's why we also want to have a battery as a backup. Sure, <laughs> you don't want to cause. Uh, but what are the things landlords and uh, real estate people are telling you as you go out to market? Like, I want it this big, I want it, what are some of the parameters they're giving to you? Well, right now we go after those big corporations, so they they have no limited with the space. So, so far we are good. But if we are going to like New York, Ch Chicago, those uh, high rise, maybe they don't have a lot of space. So we do have a solution, have a smaller model. So we can be more flexible to fit any individual locations. Excellent. All right, well, I'm gonna bring Chaz up. And thank you, Andy, please, big round of applause for Andy. He'll be back uh, in just a few minutes. Now we've got Chaz Brigo. Uh, Chaz Brigo. <laughs> Chaz Brigo. Uh, here we can. Uh, yeah, sure. We'll move this around. And I, there we go. Um, so Chaz is with Brigo. I'll let you explain briefly. Sure. What does Brigo do? What does Brigo do? So uh, we're a company out of Austin, Texas. I founded it about ten years ago, and we make uh, a robotic barista. It's essentially a food factory where you can order high-end specialty coffee on your phone just the way you want it, about 8 million different combinations. And then uh, the robot then can make those specialty coffees, 100 drinks an hour. And once it's done, it puts a lid on it, ka-chunk, and um, stores it in the back and sends you a text. And you, come in, you walk up to it, see your name, put in your code, and walk away. And so you can save a favorite uh, latte, cap, iced latte, whatever, you, whatever you're drinking. Um, Save that as your favorite menu and, and use that every day. And right now you have two locations in the Austin airport, one in SFO with a second coming, right? Uh, Is that yes, that's right. And then others are around Texas. They're around Texas, yeah. So we're in large corporate campuses. We have a couple at Dell, Samsung, 3M. Uh, we're in convention centers in Austin and, and Houston. And actually, we'll be uh, going into Whole Foods here in the next month. Um, yeah. yeah. Which is pretty exciting. And we'll be installing in a large hospital in Dallas. We're also in Lockheed Martin. So we have a number of them 
around starting in Texas, because that's what you got to do when you design something like this. It's actually pretty complicated. You want to have it close by as you're figuring it out. And right. Which, start to roll out. Which gets me into the thing, because there's more I want to get into on the automation side. But in addition to being sort of this automated coffee house, you're a full stack coffee company. So yes. you roast your own. You're going from like, yeah, you don't origin. have to do that, right? Like you could just put Folgers in there. No one's going to know. Yeah, you would. Uh, uh, so so I, I started the company, uh, you know, really thinking uh, out of spending a lot of time down in Honduras and looking for ways to create opportunities down with the people I was working with down there. And what I was kind of struck over the head back in 2008 was, um, God, the way we consume specialty coffee here in the West is pretty wasteful. We're pretty ignorant about what's going on, and there must be a more efficient way of, of getting specialty coffee made. And how, do, how could we increase the quality, reduce the cost of producing that, but then turn around and do the right thing at origin? And so it really started out as a coffee around the origin of coffee, and then how could we be better? How could we use technology not as an end, but a means to an end? And so uh, I started with, um, with the coffee to begin with. And then, like, like you, Andy, I, we had a champion barista, and I hired him to go be my model for the first model of, of the robot. How do you froth? What does he worry about? How does he stretch the milk? How does he pull the shot? What are the critical parameters? And then how would you automate that? And at the same time, the iPhone was just coming out. And I was thinking, God, if we could tie an app to that to the, and really automate the front end and the back end of the process, we could have something there. And then turn around and do the right thing at origin by knowing, doing direct, uh, basically all our coffee is direct source with the farmers. And then we, we can turn around and connect our end customers to those farmers. So like a dream, we don't have this in the app yet, but I want to be able to have you see what you like about your coffee and then would you like to tip the farmer? That would be pretty yeah, cool. That's yeah, yeah, that'd be that'd be cool. And so use the automation. And so we started out just doing robotics kind of would be boring to me. Yeah. <laughs> Tying it with the food, what goes into it and what that process is, and then what's what could you achieve with that is interesting. I wonder how exciting your life is if robots are boring. But well, uh, sure. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Living in the future. Uh, so one thing um, I didn't mean that. No, no, I understand. <laughs> so, you know, as opposed to other solutions that are out there, yeah. right, there are a different ways to attack automation. One is sort of like an articulating arm, yes. which is a rival of yours does, uh -huh, uh, uh -huh. Cafe X. Uh, there's another one called Truebird out of yes. New York, and uh -huh. they use magnetic pebbles really cool. to move things around. Yeah. It looks really cool. But all you have sort of abandoned theatricality for just sort of straight up <laughs> rails yeah. and... Plungers and all kinds of things. I think it started with the process. Patrick, my barista, he you know, is really focusing on purpose-built automation. How do you take a process and uh, both, both be able to take you know, all these different combinations that a customer might want, apply those to the different types of ingredients, and then have that process do that consistently every time, but then be able to validate that. And so everything that we do, we have to validate. So, for instance, we have sensors that can tell how full, the, how full the cup is. And we know exactly, we determined how many grams it should weigh. So we know the density of that cap. And if, that, if that's drifting off, then we can feed back to the system and, and get it either drier or wetter than it, than so, it was. So, so in other words, you make it a closed loop process right. and they're purpose built automation rather than, let's say, a process that you kind of hit the start button and you move the cup around, right. but you don't know what you made. Right? Gotcha. Okay. So that's, the key is is end to end um, closure in that process. Okay. Right. And have you found that people are using? How are people ordering? Are they going through the app, or are they going through the touch screen, or is it they start with a touch screen and then download the app? Like, what kind of traction are you getting? It, it for really that? depends on the location. So we've been at Dell, and we have two locations at Dell in Austin. It's the corporate headquarters, and. About 80% of our orders at Dell come through the phone. So people pull their into the parking lot, pull up their favorite, hit it, and grab off their crap and walk in, and, and ding, they get their text, pick it up and go. So you'll see you might have 10 or 12 people in the queue, and it's cranking out drinks, but nobody's there. And that, that's how it works in a closed campus like that. At the airport, it's almost the other way around. Um, you know, we, have, we found that a lot of employees at the airport are, are the account holders because if you're an employee and you've got a 20 minute break and you wait for 15 minutes in a line at a Starbucks, that's not a very good break. But if you can order ahead of time and then 
get your text and then go on break, pick it up and go, then you've got an actual break. So we see that more, and frequent travelers do that, but it really depends on the location. Gotcha. So speaking of airports, I want you to talk, we talked about this before, uh -huh. but you had something, you, you had to change your machine after going into SFO, and I think this is actually really instructional as people look at high traffic areas like airports, especially public ones. Yeah. Tell them what you had to do to adjust to your, well, your machine. So yeah. just so you know, the coffee house is a big kiosk. It's yeah. It's about 40 square feet. It's yeah. about 10 feet long. It's huge. Um, uh, because it, it has 700 cups worth of you know, fresh dairy and everything else in it. Uh, but at SFO, I think what you're alluding to is the visually impaired. Right, piece. yeah. Yeah, so, and that was actually before we could install it. We yeah. had to meet it. So in California, they, they put, put out a new, a new law a couple years ago that said if it was unattended uh, food retail, you had to be able to support visually impaired folks so that they could use this the same way a sighted person could use it. We didn't know about that. And we're, we're just a couple of months before installing and all of a sudden they said, oh yeah, and you have to do this visually impaired thing. We're like, what? Uh, fortunately, all our machines are tied to a central operating center that we run 24 seven. So every, there's someone all day long, all night long in Austin watching all the machines and they have a phone so you can call and they know exactly what your latte was and what temperature and everything else it is. And so what we ended up doing was putting a, like a Batman phone next to the, next to the robot and, uh, and with, you know, with Braille and basically if, you, if, you're, if you're blind you just pick that up and then you're talking to Tony back in Austin and he'll order your latte the way you want it and the robot will make it and then he'll walk you over to a little sound beeper thing on the presenter and you pick it up. So make it so that visually impaired folks can actually use it as well. And these are requirements that they're, they're, they're pretty difficult for a vending machine to do, right? How do, you, how do you look at that screen? So there you go, that's, uh, that's one of the things we had to get through, but airports are hard. Right. All right, so I mean, I think that's interesting because then now will you use that model as you go to other airports? Exactly, um, and we'll use it. You know, where where we need to, we will. Um, you know, we'll look at at the right the right locations and what they need. Um, so we'll see. Okay, uh, interesting. Okay, that's I think that that's important just because it's one of those things that people don't. You guys didn't think about it, and I, all of a sudden, I didn't think about it, and and you know, it's it's a law. You know, and most people that are are that have visual impaired, are visually impaired, are also escorted. And so typically they, they might have been able to make it, but this just makes it very clean for them. Sure, and there's yeah, no, yeah. I mean, it's nothing yeah. wrong with Nothing wrong with another, it, yeah, 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 exactly. So. And, it's, and it's good. Our, our guys are kind of bored back in Austin, so it's good for them to get a call. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Get the, uh, okay. Uh, and so I'm going to ask the same question to you. So, well, you've just partnered with, and I can't remember the name, uh, the airports. Uh, they, so SSP? Get into, yes, SSP. SSP. I knew yeah, it the, sounded like this. Yeah, the, you know, the, the big airport operators, the concessionaires that run all the, the local shops that you see in the airports, they're generally run by large, large corporations. The SSP is the largest one in the world, second largest in the U.S. So we just signed an exclusive deal with them to go put them out in airports both starting out here in the U.S. and then globally. And so, was, was that just a recognition that airports are hard? Well, um, it, it is a way, when you go into an airport, you want to you have a partner that knows how to handle airports, it already has contracts, it, makes it, it just makes it a lot easier. We worked directly with San Francisco, and uh, we worked with a partner operator in Austin. So it, it depends, each airport's different. But, and, but, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry, but the, yeah, it's just to go in with someone that already has a very large footprint really helps. Right. right. How long is the distance, uh, not the distance, what is the time between your signing a contract with an airport and your ability to get a machine installed? Let's just say yeah. bureaucracies are not an issue. Let's oh, just wow. say, you, you know, but, but, <laughs> you, no, but what I mean is like, I know it can, each, in, yeah. each, each case is different. So well, I, I'm trying to just avoid well, the answer, like yeah, every, every case is different. Every, but if, if things go us, relatively smoothly, what's the sort us, of? Well, it took us a little over a year for San Francisco. Uh, but in Austin, the second machine we put in in just a couple months, you know, so from the time they said, hey, we've got a spot for you for us to go make it and put it in. Uh, that was a couple of months. Uh, it's contractors and everything else. And Sure. I'm just, wondering, like, and I'm just even wondering from your, in terms of your production. Oh, well, we're actually, uh, we actually had another announcement where we, where we partnered with Foxconn, which is the largest uh, contract manufacturer in the world. And they're going to be manufacturing these up in Wisconsin uh, in one of their new, new plants. And so 
you know, we, we, are, we are manufacturing in Austin as a prototype manufacturing, and now they have a whole team of people in Austin learning how to manufacture these, and they're going to put it in a large plant. So, like, Foxconn makes all the uh, iPhones and things like that. They're, oh, yeah. No, they're, I, they're I, pretty, I'm pretty, pretty familiar. Large, pretty I read large. the news. <laughs> I read the news, Chaz. I know, I know who Foxconn is. I'm like, you must know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, last question, so then. that'll help. That'll speed it up. And, uh, yeah. So... How much can you iterate on a machine, given the amount of time it takes to make and put into place? And, you know, it's not like an iPhone, in that you're no. not going to come up with a new uh, coffee house every year. Right. So how set are you, and how much can you improve and still maintain your legacy machines and all your right. supply chains? Right. So we developed chains? it and architected it as a set of modules that communicate with each other. And those modules can be reconfigured into smaller formats, like what you're talking, to go into different types of locations. But really, from now, now it's a platform that's been built, and so now the iterations will be more software. Right. So if you think, like when the iPhone first came out, it only had a couple apps on it, right? And so this is a platform. It goes to your, goes to your phone, but also goes all the way down to your mouth, right? And, yeah. and so now from that, we can develop applications on it to be able to enhance the experience uh, and, and make it a much more robust experience and maintain the hardware uh, pretty consistent. Um, so Snapchat is coming to the coffee house. Yeah, we'll see. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's give anyway. Chaz a big round of applause, please. Right. And we'll bring Andy back up on stage. All right. Oh, my marketing people said take a picture of the crowd. Oh, all right. Well, we can, we don't want to disappoint. The last person you want to disappoint is the marketing, marketing. person. Oh, yeah. I mean, oh, no. woo. <laughs> that. Uh... All right, everyone, smile. Ready? All right. <laughs> Okay, uh, so here's what I want to ask you guys. You guys are both automated food systems. You both have full stack solutions. You make high-end coffee, high-end meals, uh, and you're both going after airports and hospitals and things like that. How many of these machines can a place handle? Because at some point, right, the airport vending machines are going to become another food court. Does that just replace the food court? You know, gone are the Burger Kings and everything. I guess I'm just wondering, like, is there, is there a finite number, or is this really because of the form factor, like, you're dealing exponent, like, it's just all you're passing is vending machines in between gates? Well, <laughs> I, you know, we've... Oh, you want to answer? Or you want to... Okay, you I, I, can, I can try. Um, I don't think it's going to replace, like, all... Co we don't think it's going to replace, like, all the coffee shops. People will always go there. Um, We'll, we'll give different time of day and different options for people, but I don't think it's going to be all automated. Uh, yeah, I, I think for us, we are not trying to compete with a restaurant. For us, we, we just say that we're trying to fulfill the service gap because the restaurant or other place, they cannot run in 24-7. They, they don't have those kind of budget to run it. But as long as we have the machine in place, actually the machine is sitting there for 24-7. So that's why we tell them, we are not competing. We are fulfill the gap. So that's the reason that we were there. I think that yeah, for us too, it's a it's a time of day, but it's a quality gap. It's hard to find really good coffee in a hospital. You know, and, you know, usually you don't get that. And there's a lot of time at places and time of day that that really aren't serviced very well. That could be more efficiently served with higher quality, and we'll see that. But there'll always be, and our hope is that we spoil everyone and they always want to go to a specialty coffee shop and more baristas, quality baristas are employed because everyone is spoiled uh, and they like good coffee. I don't know why you guys bothered hiring marketing people because you're smooth enough with those answers <laughs> as is. <laughs> uh, but I think, you know, what is then, as, the, as these machines come to market, right, how are you going to be able to differentiate yourself? Is it just solely on the quality of the product, right? Or is it just, if you're going into a place, and are you like, we're the exclusive ramen machine? Or are, are you getting down to that level, like exclusivity, because you don't want somebody else to come in and create a cheaper ramen vending machine that may not be as good, but it's, you know, a couple bucks less than yours? No, actually, we are work on the competitions because we are pretty proud of our quality. <laughs> so the competitor coming, maybe consumer will know which one's better. So they will just go. They'll just be gone anyway. <laughs> so we are not signing any exclusive. And then we also have the right to move out. If the certain location is not high traffic, then we can move out like 30-day notice. So that's the beauty of the automation, which is small footprint. So not like a restaurant. If you open a restaurant, you need to sign two years, five years contract. You are stuck in there. You put your money into the water. But to us, 
we are, have the restaurant in the box, we can move it around. If today I put into this convention center, no one here, I just move out. I just move to outdoor. I can put it into a truck, we can put it in a trailer, we can go anywhere we want. So that's the beauty of it. Yeah, we, we talk about redeployable capital in the same way, and we've done this. We've tried it in some locations that really didn't pay off, and we pulled it out and put it in other locations, and that, that works well. For us, um, yeah, it's a quality thing. We, we, you know, we, we are focused on the quality of, of the experience and the coffee itself. Uh, but also, uh, over these 10 years, you know, my first money was on patents, so we now have 20 issues 20 patents issued uh, around the world in lots of different countries, plus another 16 in the way. So we've been looking at uh, early on this whole space and looking at how, how you might approach this, and we've been looking at that as a defensive as well. Are you guys able to say how many either, what is the threshold that you need to go into a location? Like do you need, it needs to have foot traffic of X thousands of people in order for you to go into it? or? Ours is like if we can sell 40 bowls a day, 30 days a month, then we will go for it. Yeah, like 1,200 bowls per month, we'll go for it. So you want to sell out every day, right? Because it holds 40, 40. So that's what, yes. okay. Yeah. Uh, for us, it really, um, yeah, again, we're hand manufacturing in Austin, and one of the key things about going with a large contract manufacturer is to bring the cost down so that that, so that allows us to, to go in places where we wouldn't have to sell as much as you would in a, a high traffic airport. Um, you know, we, to answer your question, yeah, a couple hundred, 250 cups a day is, is what we think would be a nice, a good location. Uh, but that will come down as we both reduce the cost and then go into smaller form factors. Okay. Now, uh, Andy, next week you're debuting a new machine, right, in London? Yeah, we are going to London to debut the uh, newer model. So um, if you guys have a chance to go downstairs to try it, you can see that right now we only have one dispenser. So even the preparation time, after you complete the payment system, it only take you 45 seconds to wait the ramen come out. But if you, only, if you have a 30 people lined up, you still need to take about one hour. So the newer model coming with a two dispenser. So you can dis, uh, dispense two uh, customer at the same time. So actually it cut off the wait time pretty much. So that's why we have that and then we have a higher capacity model. So we are going to debut in London and we will go in, install into airport, San Francisco, San Jose. And then we are also putting it to the ski resort. So imagine that going to the ski resort, you don't need to eat a hot dog, pizza anymore. You can have a gourmet food up there within only 45 second wait time. Eat it, go, go back to the snow. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, so for you, Chaz, I'm wondering, you've, been, you've had some machines up now. What are some things you've learned in terms of customer flow? Like walking people mm. to, like Andy's point earlier, his machine can make 20 meals, but I would sit there and go like, uh, because <laughs> I wouldn't know, like, well, maybe I want this or maybe I want this. Yeah. How have you winnowed down the number of choices for people, ah. uh, but still make it a broad enough variety to where you entice a lot of people? Right. So... It, it's how we represent the menu, but the key thing is is looking at uh, an infinite number of order platforms, your phone, right? And so that makes it so you're not standing in line behind someone else trying to figure out what vanilla latte, blah, 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 that they want. Uh, you're just, you're, any, it's, anyone can lob in an order into the cloud whenever they want. So that's, that's one that makes it easier, so you're not waiting for it. And the idea that we text you when it's ready and it has a lid on, it's all set to go, you're not standing around waiting for it to be made. It's asynchronous to where you are. So we don't get in your way. That's part of it makes it easier. And then we're actually, we, we struggled with this at first, and I think we really, you know, we've learned from that. But in the beginning, you know, we gave you all the choices, and on everything, you can have 1%, 2%, whole milks, you know, almond, whatever you want. But the number of choices, there's 8 million choices. How do I get what I want? And we... <laughs> We make a latte, but if you wanted a vanilla latte, we made you choose how many shots there were. And how many people know how many shots of vanilla are in their, in their vanilla latte? Nobody, right? And so, I mean, to make it easier, oh, just make an easy button and it's a vanilla latte and I'm done, right? You know, I, you, we, we kind of stepped on ourselves in that by making it so engineering-like instead of making it more human-like in the interface. So it's, it's a user interface that's, that helps. 
And I answered your question. No, 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 I did. I think it's just because you don't have a lot of real estate. I mean, you have it on the phone, right? So people yeah. could scroll infinitely uh -huh. through and, and they're used to that now yeah. being able to customize things. But people working on a tablet and like on the Yokai machine, there's a small touch yeah. screen, right? You really have to design it so that people don't, people can read it easily. Yeah. It looks attractive. You know, I, I imagine that there's a lot of time and effort spent in. Well, we're getting a lot of feedback from customers. So we, uh, you know, once you once you order, you know, we ask you what you want it or how what you think, and they often tell us what they think, and and they'll give us feedback in terms of the ordering process. We also separated, say, at SFO, we have two order screens on either side of the machine, to, so that you're not waiting. But really, it's uh, it's an You'd like to think that we could have designed it perfectly to begin with, but really, it, it, that's an evolution. We'll be making it easier and, uh, for people over time. So, Chaz is uh, Brigo. Chaz Brigo. Uh, <laughs> his, you, we talked about you doing a full stack coffee, yeah. but you also in places offer coffee from local roasters. So you're kind of licensing out that platform. Andy, I'm wondering, uh, you know, you have these meals that you make and prepare. Are you looking to license out your technology platform so that it would be something other than a yokai meal coming out of there? I think it's similar to Brigol. Um, we start with our own yokai brand, but right now we know that our machine is capable to become a platform. For example, if there is a lot of uh, famous Japan uh, ramen shop, so we can actually just uh, invite them to join us and then we can co-brand in and then have their limited edition into our machine to become a um, limited edition uh, for a certain time. So our machine will become a platform for every famous restaurant which they want to serve the people 24-7, which they never can do before. So you would be a yokai branded box, and then it would have a special edition whatever X brand ramen uh, served up. Yeah, we are talking with several candidates now. Oh, excellent. OK. Uh, I want to open it up. We have just a few minutes left. Are there any questions uh, from people in the audience? Right there? Yeah. Yes, sir. fresh ramen, uh, or is, is the frozen, if it tastes great, people don't care uh, whether it's fresh or frozen, or maybe they don't even know or think about it? What's the take? Well, so I think the point is, how do you distinguish it's a frozen or it's fresh? You have a knowledge to distinguish it or not? The way that we do in the process is using a fresh product we have a special food process. Because I was in a semiconductor. I used a SNSOP to, to make the food manufacturing. So actually, the way that it come out when we deliver to you, actually, it's just exactly like you can get it from the restaurant immediately. So actually, I will say that's fresh. So it doesn't really matter if it's frozen or not. Like a sashimi, they do the fresh frozen, and then they give it to you. It's fresh. So how do you determine fresh or not fresh? And for us, it's all fresh milk and everything. We don't have anything there. But, uh, but it is kind of weird, because I, I spent 25 years in semiconductors as well. It's, just, it's kind of weird. A couple, well, we're geeks. Well, let's ask, uh, let, <laughs> at, uh, at the risk of cutting off somebody, but like, what from your semiconductor backgrounds has helped you create food vending machines, right? Like you were at uh, Motorola, oh, yeah. right? I, it's process. I mean, just yeah, I think I think I for me it was just striking, well, sitting in a okay Starbucks and I'm watching how they're manufacturing a product and I'm thinking, at at, at scale, how did they do that? How what a crazy way to manufacture a product and how do you do process control when there's all these distributed, little manufacturing things called baristas uh, at, that aren't trained or aren't validated. So yeah, I think thinking about process and. And it's from an engineering yeah, make background. the SOP is the most important thing. Otherwise, you will feel like if I'm the chef, I have a, I have a big fight with my wife, then I don't put the salt whole day long. How do you feel? <laughs> right? So if we have an SOP pre-processed in the central kitchen, I will make sure that every bowl that you get is exactly the same flavor. Yeah, so that's just SOP means, right? Yeah, all right. Any questions? Oh, yes, you right there. Uh, you get in the black jacket. Yeah. Um, how do you, what is your business model? Actually, there are two questions. What is your business model with uh, Dell and uh -huh. uh, Foxconn and those companies versus airports? And how do you, how do you distribute your coffee to, or how do you fill up engagements? 
Uh, how do we fill it? How do we replenish it? So we're also working with uh, another large company to do a uh, service. And so the business model is uh, there's a number of different options. On some of these, we own the machine, we restock it, we refill it, we do all the servicing. It's we run that coffee shop, right? In uh, in in some locations where we're working with a partner, we might do a revenue share back to them, and and we and we own and operate and run it. In some of the airports that we're uh, say working with SSP, they may own the machine. And we do a service, a software service support. So our, we're monitoring 24-7. They don't need to learn the technology. We keep that up. We know and we do the, the, the high-end technical work. Um, so, and, and we're working with a, a third party to do that distributed service. You know, a, a large corporation that has service techs all around the world. And they have their own training mechanism. So it depends on, on the end location, customer. Uh, we try to make it, at the end of the day, it has to work for everyone. And so that's, it's just whether we put up the capital or someone else puts up the capital. And then there was one back there. Yes? Uh, how has it been navigating local health code requirements? And did you have any major surprises around that? Um, oh, is that, is that for me? Well, yeah, I think you both. Okay, yeah. Right, right. Uh, well, I can say uh, part of our development was around, we're handling fresh milk, right? That's, that's pretty scary, right? So we went through a long technical development around handling fresh milk and, and making it so it automatically sanitizes itself every night. And then we, we went through a, a food safety certification. So NAMA uh, is an organization that's, that will certify that for it. They work with, if anyone was in a previous uh, presentation on NSF, it's similar to that. And so everything from how that milk is handled from where it's coming from, how it's delivered, how we handle it, how we deliver, how we put it into the machine, and then what the machine does, with how, what, how we sanitize it. You do these challenge studies to make sure that everything you, you do, you go through a whole process, engineering process to solve that. And then ongoing operations, if temperature in the refrigerator goes above 40, 41 degrees for 30 minutes, it shuts off, you can't order a milk-based drink. So food safety is really important, and that actually was a big part of the development to make sure that it is safe. And, and that's a, you know, that was no trivial task. And we probably spent a couple of years uh, developing that to make it and testing it to make sure it's robust. Andy, any other thoughts from you on that? Yeah, I think it's a similar thing because we all need to get a house permit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a similar thing, yeah. So we need to make sure every sensor is monitor every location like to us most important thing is the temperature so like then they go to beyond or above certain degree machine will make an alarm then we will stop sales then we will dispatch the mechanism to go on site to check what's going on if we can do remotely reset we will do remote if not the technical guy will go there excellent all right well i think we're out of time can we give please give a big round of applause <laughs>